Lovely. Hi, everyone. Really nice to see you all. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, this is the fourth, I think, instalment of conversations that um, UAG Refugee Support Society and Chapman Welcomed Refugees are putting on. And today we're going to be speaking to Anna. Um, so thank you so much, Anna, for coming along. That's really fabulous. Um, just a little bit about the society before I pass on to Isabel to tell you about uh, CWR. Um, my name's Ellie. I'm president of UAG Refugee Support Society at the uni. Um, we're working really hard this year to promote uh, the refugee cause. Um, we're sort of working on three main aims, which is promoting advocacy, taking action, raising awareness. And this particular event, the conversation series, is really paramount for us in sort of achieving that goal. Um, we're really trying to spread as much as we can and like getting the message out and really sort of educating people around some of the issues um, to do with refugees and asylum seekers. And um, the cause is growing quite rapidly, as we all know, and the support that we're getting from the uni is absolutely fantastic. And CWR are really sort of helping to boost our presence with that. So thank you, Isabel, and everybody at CWR for having us along. Um, but yeah, please get in touch with us at the uni anytime. Um, I'll put my email address in the um, in the chat. But thank you all for coming, and I'll pass on to Isabel now. Hello, everyone. My name is Isabel, and I lead on events at Cheltenham Welcome to Refugees. And it's a great pleasure to be working with Ellie and the Refugee Support Society at the uni on this particular speaker series. We generally help people who come to Cheltenham as refugees or asylum seekers. Um, we also do a lot for awareness raising and if you'd like to find out more about what we do, we'll have a bit of a quiz um, but also an update on our activities on the 26th of February that we'll advertise on our website. I'm particularly pleased that Anna's our speaker today because she's been one of our volunteers for a year and also leads our book group. If you're interested in that um, and has a specialty of being a community care solicitor and um, we're so grateful to have her so Anna please take it away. Thanks Isabel. Uh, so hi <laughs> I'm Anna. I'm going to try and cover some asylum essentials today. Um, I just wanted to put up my experience just so you know where I'm coming from. Um, and most of my experience working with asylum seekers is not actually as a lawyer, it was uh, as a case worker at a charity called the Helen Bamba Foundation, uh, which I did for about five years. And that charity supports asylum seekers with um, counselling and therapy services and also writing medical reports for uh, in support of their asylum claims. So we'll see as we go through that that's, that can be quite an important element of someone's claim. Um, and then I requalified as a lawyer and I did uh, study asylum law a bit as part of that. And um, but now I actually work as a community care solicitor um, at Worcestershire County Council. So I'm going to try and cover uh, three things uh, quite swiftly. <laughs> um, the basis of an asylum claim, what an asylum seeker has to prove. Um, the steps that you kind of have to go through um, in terms of the legal process for claiming asylum. Um, and that's going to be just the overview. And then at the end, I just thought I'd try and do a bit of myth busting on um, accessing community care, um, adult social care um, as, as a migrant or as an asylum seeker. So that's that's the aim. I'm going to try and like whistle through it um, so that we've got lots of time for people to talk about their own experience and bring their own comments and, and any questions at the end. Um, OK. So I put in this slide because uh, I just really enjoy all the quotes of judges moaning about the um, asylum system and um, to set the scene of, of how complicated an area it can be. Um, you can see there's uh, since 1971, there's been 12 immigration acts um, of re that are still relevant today. There's all sorts of statutory instruments, um, orders and regulations made by ministers at a rate of about 10 to 20 a year. There's um, thousands of pages of immigration rules that are constantly being updated. 
Um, there's loads of guidance and there's a lot of case law. So um, it's quite a lot to wade through and, and that probably uh, emphasizes why it's important that asylum seekers have representation and the fact that a lot of people don't leads to a lot of um, miscarriages of justice uh, and uh, grave consequences really for people. But for our purposes, uh, don't worry, we're not, we're not going to have to cover any of that. Uh, we're just going back to the beginning, which is the 1951 Refugee Convention. And this is the inter international treaty that the UK has signed up to. Um, and it contains the definition of a refugee. So when you're claiming asylum, you're claiming that you meet that definition. And if you meet the definition, then you're entitled to the protections under the convention, which, um, you know, most, the most important one is that you have a right not to be returned to the place place where you'd face persecution. Uh, so that's that's really the the main the main instrument that we're looking at. So the definition itself is in Article One. Uh, any person who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality and is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. And then there's a little bit at the end about uh, people who are stateless to whom the, the same protections apply. So to break that down, you, get, you end up really with seven elements that a asylum seeker has to prove um, outside their country of origin. Their fear of persecution has to be well-founded. It has to be for a convention reason, the race, religion, nationality, etc. It has to be a failure of state protection. They can't be able to internally relocate somewhere else in the country and they can't be excluded from protection. Um, for, and there's a couple of reasons for that, but mostly you, you can't be a war criminal. Um, that would count you out. So the burden of proof is on the asylum seeker to establish all of these elements. Um, and if they fall down on one, they fall down on the whole thing um, and they wouldn't qualify for protection. Uh, but the standard of proof that they have to reach is, is a low bar. So, you know, in criminal cases, you've got proof beyond reasonable doubt. In civil cases, normally you would have uh, the balance of probabilities, um, more likely than not. Um, but for an asylum seeker, it only has to be reasonably likely that they meet this definition. And that's uh, really because the law requires that we are on the side of caution in, in these cases because the consequence of getting it wrong could be catastrophic for the asylum seeker because you'd be returning them to face persecution, torture and, and all sorts of um, grave consequences. So um, in theory, at least, it's a, it's a low bar that, that an asylum seeker has to prove. So I'm just going to draw out a couple of those um, that end up being quite important in an asylum claim. Um, I would say that one of the uh, most important elements is this um, fear of persecution has to be well founded. Um, and that would be by the personal account of the asylum seeker or um, with corroborating evidence from an uh, independent um, expert. And the reason why this is important is because um, the Home Office rules and um, guidance show that uh, they can attack someone's credibility on multiple fronts and help invalidate their claims in that way. So uh, the Home Office will say that an asylum seeker has to have a satisfactory explanation if they don't have any relevant material to support their claim. And I mean, it might be a fairly obvious explanation that if you're fleeing persecution, you didn't you didn't stop to gather the evidence. But uh, that has to be explained to um, the satisfaction of the Home Office. Your um, account has to be coherent. It has to be plausible. It can't run counter to any information that um, might be available about your case. Um, you have to have made the asylum claim at the earliest possible time. Uh, which is often a, a problem that people come up against. Um, you have to have, um, you, you oh, sorry, you've, there can't be like a failure to produce your passport or having a false passport. You can't um, fail to answer questions that the Home Office might have of you. All of those could lead to them uh, making um, adverse uh, findings against your credibility. Um, if you didn't uh, claim in the first safe country that you passed through, um, or if you only claimed asylum when you were arrested for immigration offences, all that's gonna put your credibility in jeopardy. 
um, and make it harder to establish your claim. So when it comes to these kinds of um, accounts and uh, asylum seekers uh, consistency or inconsistency, the Home Office um, guidance does require that they should be considering someone's um, age, gender, the mental health issues, maybe emotional trauma, uh, mistrust of authorities, uh, feelings of shame, um, painful memories, all those things should should be considered and factored in. But to be honest, I would say that's something that usually has to be argued for on appeal rather than being taken into account at, at the time of the initial decision when the Home Office is making it. And that's, uh, in my view, because of the entire culture at the Home Office is, is geared towards disbelief, um, findings of lack of credibility being the norm. And uh, I, think, I think it's about 40% of asylum seeker, seeker refusals get overturned when they, when they go to appeal. So this culture of disbelief that the Home Office has is, is costly for them as well because they end up having all the legal costs of def, um, defending these appeals. Um, and that would be unnecessary if um, asylum seekers weren't being disbelieved in, in this unreasonable manner. So you can see that therefore um, external evidence, including medical reports, can be really important in um, documenting an asylum seekers, uh, maybe their physical scars or their mental health and the psychological consequences of the persecution that they've been through. And that can um, assist in supporting their claims. Um, if someone has established past persecution, that should be regarded as a um, serious indication of the risk that they're going to face on return, um, unless there's good reason to say that um, the persecution wouldn't be repeated. Um, and that future risk is, is really the bit that um, is mandatory, that has to be established. Um, you can still claim asylum if, if you weren't persecuted before you left. But if um, the situation in your country now is that if you returned, you would face persecution and that's the bit that you that you have to prove. And that can be helped with um, country guidance type information. And there's a lot of uh, case law around the risks that have been accepted in previous cases that um, people might face. Uh, I printed out. Um, just this one page, the tribunal's got a list of about 50 pages of cases where it's um, got accepted uh, risks for certain uh, groups of people on return. So I picked Algeria because it's the top of, at the top of the alphabet. Um, and you can see that there's a uh, case law around people fleeing military service, uh, journalists, uh, women, um, gay men, even terror suspects, the, those are kinds of cases where, where a risk on return um, has been established in previous cases and that might be of assistance to someone else establishing a future risk if they were sent back. In terms of persecution, we don't have an overall definition. Um, I think that's because uh, you don't want to uh, kind of rule, rule anything out that might, that might not have been considered previously, uh, but we're aiming for this kind of equation of serious harm uh, plus a failure of state protection would equal persecution and it has to be sufficiently serious um, to constitute a, constitute a severe violation of a basic human right. Um, so that's, that's as close as we're getting really to a, a definition of persecution. The persecution itself has to be for a convention reason. Um, so one of these five uh, reasons. Um, the one that's uh, maybe needs some expanding on is this particular social group, which is the most um, fluid and, and open to uh, change or development in the case law. Um, and that can be something uh, such as women in Sierra Leone have been established as a particular social group, and that's because of uh, a risk of uh, female genital mutilation on return. Uh, traffic people are a particular social group. Um, LGBT people in certain country from certain countries would be as, um, have been established as a as a social group and you would think that um, being being in an already established particular social group might might assist your claim but in in lots of cases that just means the home office um, pivot back to attacking your credibility so they would just say well we don't believe you are trafficked or we don't believe you are gay and um, and you could still have a very hard time um, convincing them of of your um uh, status as a as a refugee, even if even if you did fall into one of these groups. 
then you've got to show a failure of state protection. Um, it's pretty easy if it's the state that's doing the persecuting. Um, otherwise, it could be uh, an organization in control of a particular area of the state, maybe, I don't know, a, a kind of Boko Haram type situation. Um, or it's someone else doing the persecuting, but you're not getting any protection from the state. So that would be a lot of cases of um, violence against women that has no judicial redress um, in, the, in your home country. Or um, maybe there's like a gang or mafia uh, that's doing the persecuting and there's just um, the levels of corruption within the state are so high that, that that's not getting um, any protection. So again, you're looking for evidence on reports on the rule of law or um, the criminal justice system uh, for what it's like in the home country. Then you have to show that you couldn't uh, live somewhere else safely in your country. Um, and to do that, you have to show that it would be unduly harsh for you to uh, be asked to relocate somewhere else um, in a big city somewhere far away from where, from where you had come from. And to be honest, you usually would need some kind of additional vulnerability to, to try and establish this. Um, maybe some mental health issues or being a lone woman with children, uh, or you might be able to provide some evidence about uh, the conditions in your country as a whole and making it unsafe to, to travel around or through specific areas. Um, or it might be that if, you, if you're from a nation with, with quite strong tribal ties or community ties and you've been ostracized from your community, you might not find acceptance anywhere else, something like that. And then lastly, just you have to be outside your home country and you can't be a war criminal um, and you can't be receiving UN protection from UNRWA, which is, um, I think, really Palestinian refugees from, from 1948, I think, really fall into that category. So that's it. Those are the seven things that you would have to prove as an asylum seeker to become a refugee. I'm going to whip straight on into how would you go about claiming uh, in the UK and mm. so the main um, the first thing to do is uh, to try and claim as soon as possible and we've seen that um, cred your credibility can be affected if you don't uh, claim immediately so you want to claim at the point of entry or um, as soon as possible afterwards at the screening unit in Croydon and you'd be taken to a screening interview um, where you'd be asked questions to establish who you are, where you're from, how you came to the UK. You'd be starting to ask questions about, um, did you pass through any safe countries? Um, questions about potential immigration offences. So did you travel on a false passport? Um, are you an overstayer? So you can see how already it's starting to feed into questions that are gonna trip people up and undermine their claims. Um, you're gonna be fingerprinted. Uh, you're gonna be issued with your art card. Uh, you're going to be asked questions about um, do you need asylum support so your level of destitution and then there is a risk that you're going to be detained immediately um, if the home office thinks that it can uh, um, decide your claim really quickly and then and then deport you uh, they might keep you in detention um, to be honest that's probably too big of a topic to um, get all the way into at this point but um, then you're looking at your you need to find some kind of representation and get a bail application. Um, and at the moment, you know, the situation is there's no time limits on detention. Uh, so it's a really, really um, tricky situation that's um, causing a lot of problems for people. And, and again, reducing access to justice and um, leading to people being, being deported without their claims being properly considered. Uh, but hopefully you will be released on temporary admission while your claim is being considered um, and then at, at, a, at some point after that you're going to be invited back for your substantive interview and that will be with the co case owner at the home office who's going to be um, deciding your case and they will ask you um, a whole load of questions to try and draw out do you meet this definition of the refugee so it's all going to be questions related to um, those seven elements that that we've been through. And I think it's, it's fairly obvious that it's critical at that point that the asylum seeker would be able to talk about their experiences freely um, to make them under, themselves understood, either with the use of an interpreter or otherwise, um, and that they're appropriately supported at that interview um, 
if they need to be and most of the case cases they aren't there's not really legal aid for lawyers to go to um, these interviews so they mostly don't and um, that that obviously leads to a situation where this is one of the most you know the most important interview um, that the asylum seeker is going through it's incredibly stressful um, it's possibly re-traumatizing if they're having to talk through what they've been through um, hanging over their heads might be the fact that they could be detained they've they've walked back into the um, the home office and um, they're you know essentially the lion's den I suppose um, so they may have issues trusting authority anyway. So telling their story at that point in that interview is gonna be incredibly difficult. It doesn't have to be that way. It used to be the case that you were issued with a substantive evidence form and you could fill that in with your lawyer and send it back in. And that's really um, the exception to the rule now. And almost everyone has to go to sit through these interviews, which are, you know, minimum probably four hours. Uh, after, an indeterminate amount of time after your interview, you'll be sent a letter either saying you've been awarded refugee status, leave to remain, or um, a reasons for refusal letter. So I just put in here, there's actually three types of leave you might be awarded. Either the Home Office accepts that you meet the definition of a refugee um, and gives you leave to remain, um, or it might say that you need humanitarian protection, which is, you, you don't meet the definition of a refugee, but you'd st you're still facing something like the death penalty on return. So um, the UK's humanitarian obligations uh, mean that we couldn't return them. Or there's some other kind of discretionary leave on the basis of your human rights. So that would be uh, cases where there are strong family ties that can be argued for, or perhaps um, you've got a medical condition that's so grave that um, to return you would be, would be dangerous. Uh, so those are the um, three types of leave you could get. And so that means that in your refusal letter, there'll be three, three no's. They'll say, we don't think that you meet the defini definition of a refugee. And that's because of, and they'll go through all of the elements uh, that I set out and say, this is why we don't think you're credible. This is why we don't think um, there's a failure of state protection, all of those things. And then I'll say, and we don't think we've got any obligations in terms of humanitarian protection, and we don't think your human rights require that we um, offer you leave. Um, so when you get that letter, you've got 14 days to appeal. And that's if you have a right to appeal in, in the UK. Mo most people will, but there are a certain amount of cases um, from particular countries which have to be certified as clearly unfounded. Um, and that's under this Nationality Immigration Asylum Act from 2002. And that's essentially these 26 countries, uh, which um, the legislation currently says, if you're from that country, uh, your case has to be certified as clearly unfounded unless there's good reason not to. And then you can only appeal from outside the country and there's not really a good process for doing that. So um, that's a pretty bad situation for people to be in. Um, and you can see from the list, some of these cases only apply uh, to men. So as I was saying, women from Sierra Leone is a good example of, um, they, they, would, they, would, they wouldn't fall into this category. So, um, if you are in that situation, you don't have an appeal, you can only challenge it by means of judicial review. Um, that's really your only option. But if you do have an appeal, right, uh, these are your grounds of appeal, essentially the same, the same thing that it would breach the UK's um, obligations under the Refugee Convention if you were returned. And then you would go before the first tier tribunal judge um, at the Asylum and Immigration Chamber and he would hear both sides of the story. He would hear the expert evidence. Um, the the asylum seeker might be cross-examined about um, uh, what they say happened to them. Um, so it's again, an incredibly difficult, possibly re-traumatizing experience for people to go through where they're um, actively being told to their face that they're disbelieved or that their identity is being denied. If you're unsuccessful in front of the first tier tribunal, you have a couple of further options, um, but they get kind of harder uh, in terms of the grounds of appeal, the higher up you go, because the um, higher courts are trying to limit the amount of immigration work that they do. 
So um, you can only appeal on the grounds of an error of law to the upper tribunal, and then you can only appeal to the court of appeal on the grounds of important point of principle or practice. If you're out of other options, um, as a last resort, there's a judicial review, um, and that's often used quite effectively in challenging things like the um, clearly unfounded cases or um, deportations and things like that, those um, kinds of cases. And that, that, that can't be used if you have other appeal rights. Uh, so that's really the whole overview of the system. Um, this is a process that even though I've whipped through it in about 10 minutes can take years and years um, with delays at the home office um, in reaching decisions, delays in finding lawyers, problems with legal aid, uh, problems getting evidence together, getting medical reports, court delays. So it can mean that um, refugees with valid claims spend years in detention or living on asylum support awaiting decisions. Um, unable to work, unable to feel safe, not able to move on with their lives. So even though um, there's an overview of the steps, obviously I acknowledge that the reality of living with it is, is really different. And the system is designed to catch people out and the delays are baked in as part of the hostile environment. Um, and really the reality for the people that I've worked with um, as well, the the effect of receiving a decision from the Home Office or from the tribunal refusing someone's claim is devastating, not just because of what it, what it means in terms of their future and their safety, but also in terms of um, being disbelieved or, or having your identity denied, like I was saying. So um, I'd say that it's really a process that not only fails to protect people, but um, actively causes them harm and unnecessarily so because a majority end up being granted refugee status. So that is the sorry state of affairs that we're in. Um, and just before I finish, I just wanted to take two, two more minutes to just do a little bit of myth busting about um, access to community care for migrants. Um, there's uh, quite a lot in the news at the moment about no recourse to public funds and the hardships that that's causing um, in the pandemic. Um, but I just wanted to clarify around public funds that tends to mean in the way that we're using it um, as a condition of a leave to remain is no access to benefits and tax credits um, such as housing benefit. And it doesn't actually apply to community care by which I mean adult social care. Um, but it is something that can be challenged. I just wanted to put in reference to this um, Unity project because they are doing um, helping people with applications to, to, to remove these conditions of NRPF. Um, but in terms of community care, the situation is quite different. In some ways, um, the result is the same, um, but, but it's good to be aware of, of what it means for asylum seekers. So a local authority generally has a duty to provide care and support if someone meets the eligible needs. Um, so they've got got to have a physical and mental impairment or illness, which means they can't do specific things like uh, manage their nutrition, their hygiene, toileting needs, things like that, and that's affecting their well-being. So that's the overall test for um, being eligible for care and support. Um, there is a section of the Care Act which says that a local authority can't meet those needs for asylum seekers if their needs have arisen because they're destitute and because of the um, or because of the physical effects of destitution. Um, but all that really means is they have to have a um, physical and mental impairment or illness, which is um, leading to them having care and support needs, which is the test anyway. So the exclusion isn't, isn't really that much of an exclusion. Um, it's, it's there to prevent the local authority being asked to provide accommodation. Um, when someone doesn't have any other kinds of needs. But I think that um, it's, it's a fairly redundant section and actually um, asylum seekers would still qualify for care and support if, if they require it as with everyone else. Um, so it's worth not being put off uh, by, um, by some of these kind of um, scary looking prohibitions. But the situation for um, former asylum seekers is different and there is there is a strong prohibition against providing care and support to people who haven't complied with removal directions or who are overstayers and here unlawfully. Um, and for those people, the local authority is um, not allowed to provide care and support 
but it can assess someone's needs. Um, it can meet urgent needs while it's doing those assessments and it can provide um, information and advice. So there's still quite, quite a few things that it can and should be doing if someone, um, a former asylum seeker has needs in those areas. And additionally, this prohibition won't apply if um, failure to provide that support would breach someone's human rights. So if it would leave them in such a position of um, destitution as to um, amount to inhuman and degrading treatment um, or other breaches of their human rights, then the local authority should still be stepping in. So I'd say it's just, I just wanted to highlight that it's worth kind of knocking on the door a bit harder because actually um, it's not as, as um, fuller, a no as as sometimes um, it seems like it is so that's really all I, want, all I wanted to highlight on uh, that issue and you'll be pleased to know I'm going to stop talking and hopefully people have their own comments and experience that they want to speak to um, and that would be great. Anna, really insightful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, it was really fast. We'll kick off some questions if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. No, don't don't apologise at all. No problem. Um, but yeah, we'll kick off with any questions. Um, I'm trying to see like the full view of everybody. So just hold on. There we go. Um, so if you have your if you have any questions, just like sort of raise your hand physically, and I'll try and find you. Um, or just pop something in the chat if you don't want to put your camera or mic on. So any questions to start with? Oh, I'm trying to see everyone. I'm so sorry. Hi, Maggie. Okay. I, I just sort of kick, kick things off. Um, Anna, you may want to come back. We I was talking to um, one of the local asylum seekers earlier in the week who was talking about these um, uh, interviews, these substantive interviews and and obviously the, the word gets around about what this experience is like, but it really was quite mind blowing what he was saying about the, you know, a four hour interrogation to try and trip you up. Yeah. And saying that they will, his herd or the experience of, of, of people he knows is that the Home Office will provide an interpreter uh, from your country who would then seek to confirm whether you have the right accent for the region you the, the, the city you claim to come from you know um, they would ask you questions about the, the town that you said you were born in to check that you really do know on the corner of the main street um, and it did feel and he was saying most people do it on their own I and mean, it did feel hugely intimidating I mean four hours is a long interview um, and to be cross-examined, knowing that they're not trying to establish your story, but they're trying to trip up. He said something really quite, quite interesting. He said, um, it's often quite messy. Um, and you don't always get things in the right order or in the right detail. He said, actually, if you're telling a lie, you can plan it all in advance and it's absolutely word perfect. But the truth is often messy. I, I don't know whether that ties in with your, I, I found that an interesting conversation with him and I don't know whether that ties in with your experience. Yeah, I think absolutely. And I think um, the the Home Office really has been shown to leap on any small, tiny inconsistency, a date that goes, you know, that's spoken wrong or, or misspoken of. Um, and uh, it's definitely the case that someone will, um, be maybe tested on their their accent or the home office will bring in experts to try and corroborate whether they you're from where where you say you're from if that's going to make a difference to whether they can refuse you or not um yeah it's a it's a it's a really depressing state of affairs and it's um i think even in, in criminal cases um there's a lot of work that's been do, been done around um how vulnerable people should be interviewed and uh, the effects that memory has on, on evidence giving and none of those lessons are being taken over into the asylum system at the moment. Um, and that's really, really depressing because that knowledge is there, but it's being ignored. Thank you. 
Thank you. That's really great. And um, we've got a comment in the chat from Harriet. And um, she's sorry, I'm just trying to scroll to get it. Um, she said that I noticed that in the 1951 Refugee Convention, it refers to him and himself. Is this something that has been updated to include women? And um, that's quite interesting. I think a lot of the semantics around that are quite sort of pervasive. So that's a really good question. Not as far as I know. The Refugee Convention was um, updated kind of thing in 1967 because previously it did just apply to refugees that uh, became refugees before 1951. So it had to be updated to um, extend to everyone else who was, si was since finding themselves um, displaced. But I'm not sure that they took the opportunity to make, make change the, the pronouns at all. Um, but luckily that... Um, that hasn't had effect on on whether it applies to women or not or uh, any other genders so we should maybe challenge them <laughs> thank you just just pop in the chat if that helps harriet thank you um isabel isabel yeah hi oh well, thank you very much anna i was wondering um when you entered the field of asylum law was there anything that sort of struck you as surprising coming from your with your law degree what was the experience like or maybe the first few months in, on the job well I mean it was the opposite way around that I did it because I started working with refugees and asylum seekers before I'd um, studied the law so when I actually did do the asylum law side of things I was like filling in all the gaps um, in my knowledge from um, having been a caseworker um, but I remember when in 2009, when I started working for the for the Helen Bamba Foundation, I was um, very overwhelmed that this was the, the state of affairs in this country. And I, I hadn't known before that about um, us having immigration removal centres and detention facilities. And that I do remember that being incredibly shocking. Um, but I mean, now I don't know. Yeah. So. It was it was um, the opposite experience for me, um, and I think then coming to the law and and the refugee convention is a really powerful tool that has obviously saved a lot of lives um, over the years for people ha that it has managed to protect, and it seems that we're you know trying to do everything we can to um, lessen its impact, which is which is um, a really really a shame. Thank you. Um, Bill, are you happy for me to read your question out? Is that good? Okay. So Bill popped in the chat. Are there any time limits on any part? Sorry, I'm not reading that very well. Are there any time limits on any part of the application process that are in favour of the applicant? Um, not really. Um, but there are in at most stages there's there are ways that you can say well these are my good reasons for why I haven't met the time limit um I can't I can't think of it I don't know if anyone else can um but yeah I can't think of anything that works particularly in the favor of the asylum seeker um I'm afraid but I mean there are a lot of delays in the system some of them are at the behest of the asylum seeker I mean we were writing medical legal reports and we didn't have you know a lot of the doctors doing that were volunteers um, or doing it alongside their other jobs so some of the delays were coming from us in terms of we couldn't get that asylum seeker in front of a doctor for about four or five months and then we were asking the courts for delays so we were holding up the process ultimately hopefully to aid to make their claim stronger uh, but at the same time leaving them in in um, a further period of, of waiting um, and that was that's really distressing and even when you're trying to help sometimes you're also causing some harm. Thank you that's really great um Helen, uh, I can only see Helena. I see, I can see a male hand, but hi, <laughs> can I have a question? Right. Um, I was just wondering um, how the system is going to cope with up to 300,000 Chinese from Hong Kong 
and <laughs> might be an opportunity to uh, hone the system before they arrive. In theory, we're going to be welcoming these people. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine how the system will cope. It's not coping now. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's not intended to cope now. It's not, it's not fit for purpose and they're not trying to improve it. Um, so yeah, they're living in a fantasy land if, if they think that that's going to do anything but, but make it worse. Well, We've got such well, a... Possibly that's a, a subject for discussion with our MP. Uh, who is a, a lawyer by training? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots of eyebrows going up on that one, I think. Um, yeah, a really interesting point. Thank you very much. Um, and Abigail's pop popped in the chat. Interesting that the system is deliberately unfit for purpose. And um, I think... I, like, I have a question about that, if people don't mind me jumping in. Um, and uh, kind of the hostile environment policy is obviously causing like a huge barrier and consequently a massive amount of distrust that the public have of refugees. And I think the, the big systemic issue there is creating a whole ton of issues of its own. So how do you think, or how would you envision sort of changes occurring systemically? What sort of groups do you think need to be acting and acting quickly to make some changes or force the government to take some action? Yeah, it's funny because I, at, at some points in the last four years with, um, you know, the discussions over Brexit, it felt like some of the views on Im immigration were changing um, at certain points and, and now I'm not so sure. Um, it's really hard to know what what can, can be done when you've got someone um, who comes out with, with such horrible things about um, uh, migrants in, in Pretty Patel. We're really, you know, seem seem to get worse and worse and worse it's it was hard to imagine um that the hostile environment could become much worse and yet we seem to be heading in that direction um so i don't know i mean it's going to take obviously a massive effort from all of um from everyone who does support refugees and immigration into this country and i I can't really speak to what, what what those campaigns should be doing, but it does have to change. And it could, you know, the system itself could, even within the structure that it has right now, there are things that could be done to um, make it easier for people, move it along quicker, you know, put the money into it, um, change the attitudes within the Home Office about... Um, people being believed you know there's there's um you hear the stories about uh people really um being intimidated and getting um in trouble for you know accepting people and awarding refugee status so that's something that culturally um has to happen within the home office so that these decision makers aren't feeling pressure to say no to people um and that would instantly make a massive difference and save the home office loads of money i think but, um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert in that. I can't, um, I don't know for sure what, what needs to happen. Thank you. Tricky area yeah. to cover, isn't it? Um, we were actually getting loads of questions in the chat. So I'll just pop back to another one that Harriet asked, which is, can families be granted asylum together? Yeah, so um, usually if you're an adult with children, you would apply with your dependents and their asylum claims would be dependent on your claim. Um, and that can be a blessing and a curse. Um, if it's a wider family, um, you would you would probably apply independently. But um, if you had, you know, if if you get leave and then obviously you're looking down the line at some kind of family reunification um that's a different kind of different story but um unless it's a family as in a husband and a wife you would you would probably have your asylum claims linked um 
because obviously it would impact on your human rights to make a decision in terms of one and not in the other and then you might be looking at um, breaches of um, family rights so um, yes I suppose is the answer. <laughs> complicated isn't it oh, yeah let's think about that really um good question thank you harriet um abigail has asked do you feel that lawyers working on asylum issues are becoming part of the political discourse that politicizes your work to your detriment does it politicize the work to the detriment i don't know i mean i think it's hard to work in that area and not be politicized by it um, when I was um, started working, there were a lot of um, big um, organizations that were doing uh, legal support work. So there was the Immigration Advisory Service and um, I think they were called Refugee Action Group. Um, and they were big, um, big organizations providing uh, legal aid, immigration and asylum advice. And the legal aid system and probably mismanagement, I'm not sure, but um, the fact that the money from legal aid didn't come in for these cases for, for long periods of time led to both of those organizations collapsing. And then all of those uh, lawyers were unemployed and all of the people who were they were representing suddenly had no um, legal representation and we were all casting around them for jobs, us for finding the, their clients new lawyers. Um, and that was kind of 2010 time. Um, and that system really continues and legal aid is getting um, tighter and tighter in what people can do. Um, and I think as well, you sit there day in, day out and you hear stories of incredible trauma, um, the worst things that are going on around the world. Um, suddenly uh, you're, you're witness to it and asking people to repeat it, um, not in a very safe setting in your tiny office probably, um, or now over, over Zoom. And I think it would be really hard to work in that area and not be politicised about it um, and not want to go and shout about it on um, on your social media. So whether whether it's to the detriment or not, I think, I mean, people, um, I think this politicisation now of being activist lawyers, um, trying to make that sound negative, I mean, to me, that doesn't sound negative um, at all. And I think that that's, you know, you're on a bit, they're on a bit of a hiding to nothing with that. I hope that um, that won't continue because it is dangerous for people that are working in the area if they're suddenly going to be also be targeted on social media for for the important work that they're doing. Um, but I do think that people get sque squeezed out of working in in this area of law because there's there's no money in it you have to take on too many cases in order to um, keep your firm afloat and that means that the service that you're providing to people is probably less than satisfactory because you've got you know like 300 cases or something and you can only give them so much time um, and that's a really frustrating position to be in as, as someone who you know, probably took the job to try and help people but that was my rant about legal aid <laughs> Wow, I think, Sorry. no, don't apologise. It's really insightful. It's really, like, it's hitting, pressing a lot of buttons for me. I'm really quite shocked at that. Um, I don't, I just want to keep talking about it. I don't really want to move on, but that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, uh, where's it gone? Um, Aethi, I really hope I've said your name right. Um, oh, I was going to say it's Aoife. Aoife, thank you. I'm yeah, so no, sorry. No um, has do, do you want to ask your own question, Aoife? Yeah, I can do. Um, I was just wondering, what do you think the media can do to reduce this like negative image of like refugees? Because they've been given, well, essentially they've been stripped of their identity and or, like culture in a way from having to like come away from their own countries and everything. I was just thinking like, what can the media do to reduce this kind of negative image? Well, I think they can tell their stories, you know, the stories are the most impactful things. Um, there's there's hundreds out there. I mean, obviously, not everybody wants to talk about um, what they've been through, but but there are opportunities for people to do that. And if, you know, re really telling those stories are, are the things that are going to compel people when they're faced with the reality of, 
of what someone's been through and why they're asking for protection here um the stories are devastating and everyone that hears that in general is going to want to um, protect that individual and I think that that's the main way that finding spaces and ways of telling those stories is going to be the thing um, that changes things. Hi Maggie. <laughs> so can, can, I, can I just chip in and, and, and jump the queue Ellie because I think it's telling the stories because they're often quite sad and distressing and, and tragic but also telling the stories that that the people have such a lot to contribute you know yeah yeah to, to our country and and or to this country and and society here that there's some hugely talented and generous people um who want to make a contribution locally yeah i suppose one of the other things we haven't mentioned is the fact that asylum seekers can't work that they're mostly prohibited from working mm -hmm. and so that co contribution is is withheld and, and also their ability to mix with other people in the country. And I think changing that would make a big difference as well. I completely agree with you. I think um, I worked with an asylum seeker at home and for him, like not having that opportunity to integrate or to work or to have anything and um, people didn't understand him. And I think, some sorry to sort of tangent, but one of the things you pointed out earlier about sort of um mental health cases and that being part of like their access to support he had terrible terrible ptsd and couldn't access diagnosis for it so really lost out on any support and opportunity which was a nightmare and eventually got into college and was told that he couldn't stay so it's the barrier is massive um interested to hear that thank you Abigail I've just seen your comment but thank you um I will let people know about your project um so Helena has asked another question do you get professional psychological support to help you deal with the traumas that you hear about well it's interesting I don't think that most um law firms are providing for anything like that for their staff but the Legal Action Group has just published a, a little um, research book about secondary trauma or vicarious trauma, I think they're calling it. Um, and I did experience a bit that myself um, working for the charity for five years. Um, and the charity was it was already providing counselling anyway to the asylum seekers. And then it did provide some kind of supervision to the staff for us um, every couple of weeks to go and talk about um, some of the things that we'd been through. But I would say the thing that most impacted my mental health in working with this group was the um, the challenges in terms of being able to help. Like the need was so great and the resources to help was so small that ultimately that ends up really really um affecting you because you hear you someone comes in to see you and they tell you everything um that they can about uh what's happened to them and they're asking for help they don't have any other options and the help that you can provide is so limited and so small um in comparison to the need that it, i think that that really gets to people um and i think if that that situation was better um people would find it easier to deal with the things that they're hearing and not take on um, you know some of the um, trauma that that they um, are witnessing as well I think. <laughs> Thank you does that help I've just lost the chat lovely okay um um, 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 oh, um, Chloe has asked, are there any LGBTQ plus support groups for refugees, as I've read about many having trauma and who are struggling with who they are? Well, I know that, um, I don't know if it's still called this, it was the UK and Lesbian and Gay Immigration Group, UK ALGEG. Um, they were doing really good work um, in London. Maggie, did you say that there was someone who, who works with this group? That you knew. There is, and his. I think Ellie is speaking at the next conversation. Yeah, that's right. Month. Um, yeah, the um, a, a, a local organisation, Gay Gloss, work with Gaius to support um, the LGBT plus 
asylum seekers who are in Gloucestershire, not a, not a huge number of people compared to some of the cities, but yeah, there is something locally and Ian speaking um, at, ne at next month's conversation. Amazing. Yeah, that's going to be a good one. Um, so, uh, Chloe, if you want to come along to that one, that should be really helpful for you. Um, sorry, I'm trying to scroll through the chat. Um, okay, um, are there any other questions by raise of hands? Um, there aren't any left in the chat at the moment. Hi, Louise, okay. Do it. <laughs> there we go. That's my clicking isn't good enough. Um, and have you got any um, any figures or percentages of people uh, who manage to uh, get become recognised asylum seekers? Maybe it's an average of the last ten years, or is that not available at all, Anna? Um, I think it is available. I don't think I have it. I don't have it to hand. Um, I know that every year we uh, initial refusals are about 60 to 70 percent okay. and about 40 percent of those get overturned on appeal. Um, yeah. But I don't know the numbers in total. Okay. Well, it gives, gives us a vague idea. Thank you. Um, that's great. Any other. So I'm just trying to scan um, any other questions. Anybody at the moment? Yes, definitely. I can share the slides. Emily asked that in the chat. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm really hoping I'm not missing anybody. Um, if I have missed you, just pop an exclamation mark in the chat or something. Um, thank you. There's quite a lot of us today, so it's difficult to see everybody. That's really, really great. Um, I think if that's everybody's questions, um, unless Isabel, you have any more? No, cool. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for coming and thank you, Anna, for giving us a really insightful sort of look into this. Um, I know it's an area that a lot of people should really clue themselves up on. I think it would really help with people understanding um, how asylum seekers and refugees are sort of the challenge and the challenges that they're facing at the moment. And um, so thank you very much. Um, We'll be posting the recording of this on all of our social media, sort of with the uni and via CWR. So if you want to sort of dip back in, it will be available. And uh, like Anna said, we can share the slides. Um, and the next conversation will be with Ian Vesti. And that's, oh, when's that? That's the 10th of March. Um, but you'll get all the information about that. But thank you, everyone. And thank you, Anna. It's been really, really fantastic. And I'm expecting we're all safe. No, it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, lovely. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We'll see you soon. Pass back to Isabel. Yeah.